The Building Better Business podcast is the best place to learn how to take your business to the next level. It's no longer enough to earn good profits. You need to develop a network of connections as well as use all types of marketing to your advantage that will put you over the edge. Hosted by me, Steve Eschbach, a financial executive with decades of experience in dealing with businesses and business people, we'll learn how this all comes together. Join me and my expert guests as we delve into the many facets of owning the business and how to become a good, caring business owner. Listen how making a difference in your community can attract all sorts of clientele, which in turn will build you a better business. Greetings of the day, my fellow listeners, and welcome to another edition of Building Better Businesses. I am your host, Steve Eschbach. I am an owner of Transworld Business Advisors here in Naperville. I'm one of six or seven owners in the greater Chicagoland area. Our specialty is assisting business owners confidentially sell and matching them up to qualified buyers. But we also assist business owners if they want to take that expansion route a couple of ways. Number one, if they would like to buy another company in their field, that's what we can do. Additionally, we do franchise development. So if you're a, uh, an entrepreneur looking to expand via the franchise model, uh, we have the expertise uh, with a sister company to assist you doing that. And also uh, we do franchise sales. And uh, believe it or not, the first few uh, transactions that I did were executives are in transition looking to get into the entrepreneurial world, and they did it by buying franchises. So I'm delighted today to uh, share with you another circle of influence, another subject matter expert, Aaron in Fultz is your last name, and you are a marketing consultant and small business coach. You are the founder of Acorn Studios, a business coaching and marketing consultancy. You have a, an entrepreneurial background. You did own your own photography company, and you've taken all that experience and wisdom, and now you do that helping business owners get to the next level. So first of all, Aaron, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. I'm delighted to be here. Good for you and good for me. So tell me a little bit about uh, Acorn Studio. How does that how does that operate? Tell me about your firm, how many colleagues you have, whether you're a solopreneur partnering with outside individuals or you've got a staff. Tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So at Acorn, we I primarily work with small to mid-sized businesses, uh, service-based mostly, um, that want to fill a steady pipeline of leads. A lot of them have a hard time doing that and moving out of just a word of mouth kind of how and how they operate. And so I help them develop a really clear brand and marketing message and then translate that into a marketing sales funnel. And so I am a solopreneur. I have a, an assistant that works with me. Um, and then I, I do contract work with different experts as I need somebody um, to do development on a website or do the tech side of things. I'll pull in people on projects in an as needed uh, basis. But for the most part, it is just me and a VA that, um, that operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, you're not unlike many of the other solopreneurs that I come in contact with from time to time. So that's great. We're going to explore that a little bit more in greater detail because there's a lot here on your interview topics that I would like us to cover. But as I do with most of my guests, we have to rewind the videotape for those that uh, remember what videotapes were. We're going to go back to your childhood and tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Where were you born? How were you raised? What kind of influence your mom and dad and any other family members had on you back then? What were your aspirations then and how did they come to be where you are today? Yeah, so I was born in Mississippi, uh, raised here my entire life and, and most of my life raised just outside of Jackson, which is where my husband and I are raising our family today. Uh, funny that I, I didn't picture myself staying here, but yet here I am and I really do love it. Uh, this is home for sure. My growing up, I am the oldest of eight kids. And uh, so a big family, loud and never boring. And so I was, I was the, being the oldest this, you don't have older siblings to look up to and kind of, you know, follow along. I was the trailblazer of, of the crew of us. And, um, my parents, my mom was a stay at home mom. So, uh, my, you know, all growing up, I thought, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, follow in my mom's shoes. Like I'll, you know, have a family and, and raise kids and uh, so forth. And didn't have huge career aspirations in my growing up, but my dad, he is a CPA and worked for, 
a firm for my most of my younger growing up, but in probably middle school, like later middle school, later elementary, uh, early middle school, uh, he left the firm he was with and he went out on his own and opened his own practice. And that in so many ways, as I look back, I didn't see it, of course, at the time, but as I look back, I see how he grew his own practice, has still continued to be a small, because that's what he wanted practice, but he was always around, like he was available for ball games. He was there um, showing up at things for me and my siblings in a way that if he had had a traditional, you know, nine to five sort of job that uh, he was having to report into would not have been able to do. And so really saw both the struggles as well as the freedoms, potential freedoms of of being an entrepreneur and and having your own thing and growing your own business can bring. And so what that instilled in me was one, hard work. He is an incredibly hard worker, but also uh, just not being afraid to try things, like not being afraid to go out on on your own and, and do something. And so never really had, like I said, didn't have huge career aspirations as I went to went to college and and went to school. But as I look back now and see the influence of, uh, I never felt It was not modeled to me to go, you know, get a job at a big corporation and just sort of punch the clock and, you know, till you hit retirement. Like that just was not the view that I had of work. And that has certainly played into where I am today and seeing the path that I have have taken um, since then. Those are the early years and those are the early influences. So it's funny that you mentioned that long story about your childhood and your parental influence, which I think is fantastic. I think, uh, you know, what your father did uh, in terms of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, he didn't have to punch a clock and report nine to five. And you have the flexibility to interact with parents. But if he was like me, uh, there's sometimes on a Saturday morning, you got to go take care of a client or a Sunday afternoon. You got to kind of do a showing. So there's flexibility, but you have that flexibility. And you can almost call the shots, if you will. Nowhere in your childhood story did I hear anything about photography and you owned your own photography for a business, right? Yeah, I did. So I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, um, I always loved art, creative things. I tended to, to gravitate toward creative things, even in school, um, as a kid, and I ended up studying art in college, uh, kind of fell in love with photography late in my probably junior high, high school years. And, um, I have great pictures of my, some of my younger, one of my younger sisters, I would dress her up and, you know, make a backdrop and, and (laughs) make her pose for me for, for photos way back in the day. But when I went to college, I studied, I got a degree in art and studied photography, uh, which I really loved, but didn't have career aspirations again, really to take that and turn it into a business until after graduation, when I went out and ended up photographing friends, family, the story of a lot of photographers, actually, uh, that you photograph friends and family, they ask you, you know, hey, could you, you know, the snowball effect of people, you know, the phone ringing and people saying, hey, I heard you, you know, photograph so-and-so, could you photograph my family too? And that sort of snowballed into me growing that business. Um, And I I ran that for just over a decade, had had that photography studio and uh, really loved that and, and grew it and learned a lot along the way. But it was early in those days that I was taking my creative skills and those things, marrying them with business and actually realizing that I loved business just as much as I liked the photography piece. And so pretty quickly, photography just became a tool to be in business. And it was sort of surprising to me that I I really fell in love with business and uh, enjoyed the marketing side of just the the creativity of going, how do I get people in the door? Um, There is inherent creativity and needed to run a business and to do it well. And so translating that into the business that I run today, which is uh, marketing consulting, a lot of marketing strategy, copywriting, those sorts of things that I'm, I'm working with companies now. But that began, the path was not a straight one, like most people's are not, but the path began to get me to today pretty early in, in those days of, of growing and, and operating that photography studio. So whatever happened to that photography firm? Is that still out there? Did you sell it? Did you uh, wind it down? Is it what? What happened to it? 
Yeah. So I did wind it down. The further I got along, photography is a pretty physical thing to, to do. You're schlepping around, you know, lots of photography gear and equipment and those sorts of things. And I knew that I needed an exit strategy and wanted to wind that down and, and kind of considered a lot of options of what that could look like, but ultimately decided um, just to close that piece down and transition into what I'm doing today. So that's no more. I occasionally have people who still call me and uh, try to pull me out of retirement <laughs> here and there. And if I love you enough, I'm, I might consider it, but I closed that down back a while ago. So uh, there's a word or two in your interview, Valerie, and we're going to get to this because you have four key topics that I want to cover before we end this interview. But you talk about a passion. Did the passion disappear from photography and was more so in marketing or is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it, it really did. I mean, I still love photography. I love the medium, but I love the strategy problem solving that I employ with the marketing work that I do. And uh, photography just, I still enjoy it. Um, I still appreciate it, but I just didn't have the same love for it that I did in the early days. Those are important words there uh, because uh, it basically tells the world, Aaron, that uh, if you don't absolutely love it, uh, you won't succeed as well as you will with something that you do love. There are four very interesting topics here, and I think we can cover them all. So I'm going to go through them right now. So one of the questions is why most marketing is a waste of money. And I'd like to hear your view on that. Tell me a little bit more about that. There's got to be some marketing that is worth the time and effort and dollars you spend. But why would you make that statement? Why is most marketing a waste of money? Yeah, it's a gutsy statement, right? <laughs> because it's yours, not mine. It's yours. Oh, I know. I know. Well, and I stand by it. Um, good, good. Yeah. So, you know, marketing should have a return on investment, right? A lot of marketing does not have the return on investment. And often the reason, there can be a number of reasons, but at core, the reason that's most common is because the marketing message is unclear. We think we're clear in the words that we're using. We think that we are. Uh, it's really obvious what we sell, uh, how it's going to make our customers' lives better. But if that doesn't show up very, very clearly in the words that we're using on our website, in ads, in email campaigns, whatever format it takes in, in our marketing efforts, if the words aren't clear, if it's not really, really obvious to people, how your the problem your product or service so solves and how it's going to make your customers' lives better and how they can get it, that you're not making it too hard for them to give you their money, <laughs> then it's going to be a waste. And right. I see, I've had clients that come to me and they've spent, you know, mid five figures on a, on a new website. And I get to look at the website and I go, I don't even know what you do. Like, I can't even figure out what you offer. And that is a tragedy. So uh, getting the words right and the message right is really, really important in your marketing. Yeah. So yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Your next bullet here is using narrative story to position your company as a solution to a problem. And you know, it's interesting you mentioned that. And, and I'm going to add my comment. I'm going to have you respond accordingly. So we as business professionals are looking to help others solve a problem that they can't do themselves. Where many business owners we come in contact with, they basically tell you, this is what I can do without even asking what your pain points are. So I think that's what you're saying. But I'm going to have you elaborate in your own words. Please do so. Yeah, that is what I'm saying, that we do have to position. People buy solutions to problems, right? So we have to position what we offer, product, service, whatever it is, as a solution to someone's problem um, in order for them to want to buy. But if we can position it in such a way that uh, we are using narrative story to do that, and positioning it in the context of a story. So you are customers are a character in the story. They're the hero of the story. They want something. Um, how can we identify in our marketing messages and be really clear? I understand what you want and I understand the problem you're up against that's keeping you from getting what you want. And I can help you. Like I get it. We show empathy. I understand what you're up against, but I also, we demonstrate authority. We have the ability, we have experience, we have helped other people overcome this problem through our product or service, and we can do the same for you. And then presenting a plan to get there, and then really clearly calling our customers to take action, to solve the problem, to buy now, you know, whatever version of that is for our, our companies. And then to paint a picture of what success looks like if they choose to work with us and also helping remind them 
there is something at stake. There is something to be won or lost in a decision of whether you move forward with working, you know, with a company. And if we can communicate all of those points in our marketing message, it's actually those are, that is a framework for narrative story, very high level. And we can use that framework to really clearly position our products or services as a solution to a problem. I totally agree with you, Erin. There's nothing more powerful than have having the experience to demonstrate, yeah, that situation I'm familiar with. Here's a specific example, calling to mind specific examples. That further demonstrates your, uh, your ability to you know, solve that pain point, if you will. So I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, absolutely. And the framework I just, you know, very high level described, um, I I have to give credit where credit's due. That's the story brand framework was developed by a company called story brand and Donald Miller. And I'm a certified guide through their program. But that is a it's a proven framework that's worked for uh, thousands and thousands of businesses and their marketing messages to to really clearly communicate in a way that a customer will engage. I'm glad you mentioned that because in your bio, it talks about you are a story brand certified guide and a business made simple certified coach. Did you actually have to take a test to get that certification? Yeah. So I went through several, lots of training to get there to get both of those certifications. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Very good to know. Uh, Two other points we want to cover. And one goes back to your website where you were talking about someone you knew spent five digits worth of dollars to enhance their website and you still didn't know what it was that they did. This is very, very good. Five things every website should include to maximize for conversion. Tell us about those. All right. So the header of your website, when you land on a website, that the part that you can see before you start scrolling should answer three questions. It should answer, what do you do? Really, really clearly. Just state the product or service that you sell. How it makes your customer's life better and then how to get it. A really clear call to action button that's your version of buy now or schedule a call, whatever the one next step you want somebody to take to do business with you. You wanna make sure that call to action is repeated all throughout your your website, that it's very, very clear. You're not burying the cash register back in a, you know, back in a closet somewhere that you're making it really, really clear the next thing that somebody needs to do to do business with you. You want to make sure you include testimonials, depending on if you're a B2C, B2B company, uh, testimonials that use your customers' words to show how you can help. We don't want to need to toot our own horns as businesses, you know, leverage your customers, leverage logos of, you know, clients you've worked with if you're a B2B company um, that just show authority and demonstrate that you can, can help other people. You also want to have a way to capture people's information. So if you're not using a lead generator of some kind, and we see them all the time where you go to a website and there's a way to enter your email or contact information in exchange for some sort of free value, you're really missing out on an opportunity to uh, capture leads. And then you can have an opportunity. There's ways that you can nurture those leads into the sale. So if you don't have those things on your website, oh, one last that I forgot, you need a plan. What is the plan to do business with you? High level, three steps. Here's step one, step two, step three. Remove the fog for people and how to move forward. It all sounds very obvious when you hear it, but there's so many websites that don't have this and they're losing business. They are losing business if you don't have these pieces on your website. No, that totally makes sense. And uh, it gets to your point. I think what you said in all those five items is that it has to be clear. It has to be simply understood. Otherwise, they're not going to scroll anywhere. And they're not going to click anything else. They're not going to scroll anywhere else. But all those items are essentially important. The one last item you have here in your interview topics is how to honor the natural stages of a relationship in your marketing. Now, you and I both know as entrepreneurs and business owners that relationship building is a critical component for us to even get from step one to step two. And more often than not, I know many business owners, that's the first thing they do with initial meetings is just to develop a rapport. So tell us a little bit about how you honor the natural stages of a relationship in your marketing? Sure. So I love this question because I see mistakes on both ends of the spectrum of of not honoring the natural stages of a relationship. So the stages are 
step one, we just have to peak curiosity. As a business, we need to peak curiosity in the minds of our customer, or potential customers of how, you know, why they should even be interested in what we offer and how we could help them. And so the ways that we do that are by positioning what we what we offer as a solution to a problem. We've already talked about that. It's by being really clear so people can put us in a category in their mind and go, okay, I understand how they could they could help me. So peaking curiosity which then moves into the enlightenment phase of a relationship. And that is the getting to know you phase. That is where there, whether it's in a conversation one-to-one, it, you know, it's going to vary by business model, but it's how do they find out more information to get to the point where they're being nurtured and ready to move forward to the third stage of the relationship, which is commitment. And that could look like a micro commitment. That could be as simple as giving you their email address in exchange for a lead generator on a website, or it could be scheduling it, being willing to give up their time to schedule a call or the ultimate commitment, right? Exchanging uh, dollars and they actually do business with you. And so in our marketing, we want to be clear, whatever action we're doing, whether it's leveraged online in our website, you know, in a marketing campaign of some sort, or it's in one-to-one relationship and conversation with a potential customer client is where are we in those that those three stages of a relationship? Have we pe- uh, peaked curiosity enough to get them to enlightenment and then move toward commitment? Or am I asking to them to marry me on the first date? Um, I don't know about you, but my link LinkedIn direct message uh, or inbox is filled with people that I have never met, have zero context for what they do, asking me to schedule a call with them. And I'm like, I have no, you are asking me, you are like skipping step one and step two of these natural stages of a relationship. And I am, would be surprised if they're getting very far with other people in that. And so we need to honor those stages of a relationship, whatever the action is in our marketing. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I totally can share with you the same experiences that you have on LinkedIn. They just come, they, you know, more often than not, I respond, you know, I've got to know, like, trust you before I refer you. And we're not even at the K. We don't even, we don't even know each other yet. So, but in any event, some people do have luck. Some of them don't. Hey, unfortunately, Aaron, it's time to say that the, the uh, podcast time allotment is over. Uh, is there anything we haven't covered? I covered your four bullets and you did a great job and you spoke so eloquently based on your past experiences. So I know you're a subject matter expert in that regard, but is there anything else that we haven't covered that you want the audience to be aware of? Yeah, I'll just say, um, I'll put some resources for your audience at my website, where if they want to download the, those things you need on your website, they can grab that. I have a couple of other resources there as well that may interest your audience if they want to know, where do I start? How do I know if I am being really clear in my marketing message? And if if you are not and want to move forward and, and getting clear, I have some resources they can get there. And so if they go to theacornteam.com forward slash better businesses, you can get access to that. But other than that, I don't think that there's anything else. Well, you went ahead and answered my final question, Rick, (laughs) we'll find out more about you and you already covered it. So is there another site you want them to go? How about LinkedIn? Anything else you want them to go to to find out more about you, Aaron? Sure. If on social, if you want to connect, um, my name, Erin Foltz, Foltz with an S at the end, um, is the best way to find me um, at on LinkedIn, and that's really the social platform that I'm on the most. If, if you want to connect, now, as you that. heard, it, yeah, as you heard earlier, do not just reach out. Just say, "Hey, I heard you on Steve Eshbach's Building Better Businesses podcast," and that way, that's a good segue mm-hmm. into getting the time and attention for Erin. Erin, thanks so much for sharing your uh, your expertise, your wisdom, your insights. I appreciate appreciated those five tips on your website. I think I'm going to go back and check those right now uh, because I think those are critically important. And you audience, thank you again for your time. And uh, uh, we enjoy your listenership. So we we welcome you here. We welcome you to subsequent ones down the road and uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. 